The next section is what is an opioid. And on this slide, you can actually see at the top a number of the different types of pain pills. They'll come in tablets, typically, or capsules. Some are short-acting, others are long-acting. Uh, the longer-acting ones have become more popular for the treatment of acute and chronic pain. At the bottom, the very bottom, you'll see actually you know, a poppy pod. This is the opium poppy plant. This one is dried, and you can see that the poppy seeds have come from the inside. So this is exactly what you see on your poppy seed bagels. Uh, and believe it or not, if you eat six bagels and you go to your employer and you have a urine test, uh, you could actually test positive for the naturally occurring opioids that are in the opium plant. You know, in the middle band there, you'll see white and then sort of a brownish and then a dark. These are the different types of heroin. So white means it's much more purified uh, and some of the you know, extra ingredients that are in the, the gum that comes from the poppy plant when it's harvested uh, are all removed. Uh, the gray or brown heroin typically comes from Mexico, the white often from Asia, and then black tar is more of a, a, an impure product that instead of being a powder is more gummy in consistency. So what are opioids? They're any drugs that contain the, the natural chemicals you know, in the opium poppy plant, and there are three of them. Morphine is the main one, codeine, and thebane. You never hear much about thebane, but you probably have all heard something about morphine or codeine. Codeine being a common additive as a cough suppressant, and morphine being a pain medication that's been used by injection into the muscle or the vein or orally for 50 years or more. Uh, but there's a naturally occurring group of compounds that are in these plants. There are also some natural opioids in our brain. Uh, these are longer lasting. Uh, this is the theory behind the runner's high, that if you exercise to a certain intensity level and to a certain degree, you start to release these natural uh, painkillers. It also happens with injury, an auto accident or in combat, where an individual has a grave injury, but they do not feel pain. So it's a self-protective part uh, of our brain and our body. Uh, these natural compounds in plants, in nature, however, can be modified by a chemist. Could be a drug dealer, it could be a pharmaceutical company. Uh, could happen in a basement or it could happen in a big quality control plant. But there are many, many different synthetic derivatives of those original three compounds that you find in the opium plant. Uh, it can come as a pill, a capsule, a powder, a liquid, and even a lollipop. Uh, there's a fentanyl lollipop that you suck on, fentanyl being a painkiller that's typically used for much more severe pain. Uh, so you can swallow it, you can drink it, you can smoke it, you can take a pain pill and crush it up and snort it. If you do that, it goes in much more quickly. Uh, you can inject it uh, or you can suck on it if you prefer lollipops. But you know, all have the potential when you get to the higher dosage ranges to suppress your respiration to block the breathing center in the lower part of the brain and lower your level of consciousness you know, and make you at great risk for an overdose. So what are opioids used for in medicine? Uh, primarily they're used for pain management, you know, either acute if you have a, an abscessed tooth and it gets pulled out by your dentist and it was difficult to do and you swell up and it hurts a lot and throbs for three days in a row, you may well be given a pain medicine. Or you have elective surgery, you may get pain medicine for three to five days and then shift over to a non-narcotic pain reliever. It's also used for cough suppression. 
so sometimes a, a physician, a nurse practitioner, a physician's assistant will want you to be able to rest at night and codeine is a very good suppressor of cough that might keep you awake all night long and it's been used that way for many years. Now look at the feelings that can be produced by opioids and look at the first group and then compare that to the second group. So you get a euphoric feeling that's described by most as a raise in energy level, confidence, motivation, a content, contented feeling, but then on the other hand you get sedation, escape, detachment. Well how can the same medicine produce two very different types of effects. It's because in those places in the brain where the opioids go, there are different types of receptors. In fact, there are at least three that we know about. This mu receptor is the one that we worry about the most because when an opioid goes to that mu receptor, that's when the breathing center gets blocked. Uh, so it could be partially blocked or fully blocked. Uh, that's also where the level of alertness center is uh, for our brain and our body. And it can get blocked in the same way at the same time. On the other hand, that kappa receptor is the one that explains the more stimulant properties of a painkiller. You might not have thought that a pain medicine could produce stimulation, activation, motivation. But in fact, most individuals that you know, an addiction specialist would see who are using pain pills will note to you that the reason they use it is primarily because of its energizing or activating effects. So not what you might have expected. Uh, as I said before, the duration of action can be quite short, you know, two or even three hours or shorter if it's injected or smoked. If it's ingested, swallowed, it can be a longer effect, uh, but the longest acting uh, medications, uh, pain medications, can be up to 24 hours. An example of that would be methadone, which is used for pain control and for the treatment of opiate dependence. Uh, and the, the big worry before uh, overdose is that addiction can develop. So there can be misuse or heavy use. The person's not, not yet addicted, may never become addicted, but they'll use enough on any one occasion that will come from that a risk of an overdose and a loss of consciousness. Uh, I've seen many individuals who weren't addicted but were engaging in risky use. This is especially true of younger persons, teenagers and young adults who don't really have a, a sense of how risky what they're using is and sometimes they don't even know what they're using. So when the dosage rises to that threshold it can very suddenly block the breathing center and breathing goes down to an extremely low level or stops completely and this would be the, the hallmark sign of an overdose. This is not a chemistry class, but it's just worth taking a look at how similar these different chemicals are. If you look at morphine on the top row in the middle, there are four rings. So if you ever took organic chemistry, or if you ever want to take organic, organic chemistry, this is what you would learn. But if you look to the left of those four rings, you'll see a little side chain. And in each one of these, there are slight differences in the molecular structure of the side chain. It's very easy to make heroin from morphine. In fact, heroin is not active in and of itself. It's got to be metabolized back to morphine. Uh, it's just easier to uh, use it to inject it uh, or sniff it. It goes in more quickly but then it's metabolized to its most active ingredient which is morphine. Uh, and then hydrocodone uh, 
uh, and oxycodone, so hydrocodone, uh, when it came out as a brand, was Vicodin or Lortab, so you may recognize it by that name. Oxycodone, Percocet, these are both short-acting, but hydrocodone, at least for 20 years, has been in the top 10 medicines prescribed all throughout the United States. So it's been widely prescribed for a much longer period of time than this 10-year uh, period where we've seen this rapid rise, primarily in these newer agents. Uh, the newer agents in some ways are better, uh, but in other ways they're worrisome because they're going to be used in higher dosages. If you have a time release or a long acting pain pill and you crush it, you break the time release and you get flooded with an extremely high dosage and there have been overdose that have occurred just from sniffing a crushed up pain pill. So where do these opiates go in the brain? Literally anywhere they want to go. But if you actually study where are their mu receptor sites, you know, they're in the top part of the brain, the middle part of the brain. If you see that red band in the middle, this is the area called the pleasure center of the brain. And this is where all addictive substances go to produce effect that individuals like to some extent. It also produces some negative effects. Down low there, you'll see uh, a little line that says pain center in the lower part of the brain. Just below that is where the breathing center is. That whole lower area is where your level of alertness circuit is. So when the opioid goes to those receptors in those circuits, you know, that's when you get the effect of a drop in level of consciousness and a partial or full blockage in breathing. So this just shows on the right you can see that there are mu opioid receptors at the top, in the middle, at the bottom, and even down into the spinal cord, uh, which is a little bit of a surprise that a pain medicine could actually slow down the speed with which a pain signal goes up to the brain. So it just points out that opiates and opioids are natural in nature. They exist in our brains without us taking a pain medicine and there are sites all through our brain where these medicines go to produce helpful effects but also then bring with with it risk. Just say a, a bit about addiction in general. We now know there are four circuits that are involved in the development and maintenance of addiction. That reward center there, the same one I pointed out on an earlier slide, this is where the pleasurable effects of substances occur. If you drink too much or use too many drugs and you recognize it, then hopefully you would learn from that experience. But that memory and learning circuit behind there doesn't seem to work quite as well in a person at risk for or who has an addiction. So you don't learn the lessons quickly enough or strongly enough and therefore you persist in the risky behavior. That motivational area, the green area, uh, instead of motivation to learn and improve uh, and be a good friend or family member, those things fall away and you get a very narrowed pursuit of the drug itself. So the world narrows to you know, finding the drug and using the drug. And then the control centers, which would say, this is not a good idea, the blue area. You know, don't do this. So this was called the stop part of the brain. That doesn't seem to work as well in persons that become addicted. In individuals that use substances earlier in life, uh, we believe that each of these four circuits you know, gets impaired because the brain's not yet developed. So these are just a list of some of the links uh, of the duration of action for the different substances. You see methadone's quite long acting. If it's used to treat opioid dependence, you can take it once a day, but if it's used to treat chronic pain, typically you would take it two or three times a day. Uh, Heroin, that duration of action would be only if it was 
pretty pure heroin. Street purity can vary from 15 to 80 percent, so the duration of action will vary with the purity. And then you can go on down the line. The fentanyl patch is a little bit like a nicotine patch that you might have heard people use to try to quit smoking. You put it typically on your back and it delivers a steady dosage of a pain medicine over two to three day period. That's extremely common in persons who have pain from cancer or some other terminal illness. These are just some examples of the prescription opiates. We've really gone over each of these, uh, but some are less potent. Hydrocodone, Vicodin, Lortab is not as strong as hydromorphone, Dilaudid, uh, or Opana, oxymorphone. So doctors typically have a, a list of you know, weak, mid and stronger. And the more severe the pain or more persistent the pain, the stronger the medicine may be that's prescribed. Uh, but any of these can be found out on the street and can be purchased, or individuals can go to doctors and get more of them than they really do need because they're in the midst of an addiction and need to continue to prevent you know, withdrawal symptoms from developing. Uh, some additional ones, I said morphine's been around you know, as long as I've been practicing medicine, 35 years, but long before that. Uh, codeine, you know, in its liquid form in a cough syrup. Methadone either comes in a tablet or in a liquid. Typically in a methadone treatment program, it would be given in a liquid form. Uh, and then a newer agent used in the treatment of opioid addiction is buprenorphine. Uh, and that's something that you put under your tongue that's dissolved very quickly. That's also long acting and you can take it once a day uh, and that's sufficient to keep those withdrawal and craving circuits turned off. Uh, this is prescription fentanyl. This is the little lollipop down below. You know, there's a kid getting to the lollipop so it's just a reminder uh, that these medicines are risky for adults, but they're especially risky for children. And so you have to make sure you secure these you know, in a safe place that you know, children uh, of all ages can't get to. Uh, these are the different forms of heroin which we've gone through. I only want to make one additional point. The heroin is mixed with water. Uh, typically heated up so that the particles dissolve, but not all of them dissolve. So when it's pulled up into a syringe for injection, uh, usually there'll be a little filter that's used, typically a little piece of cotton, so that the bigger particles are not brought up into the syringe because if they're injected into a vein, they could actually cause problems in the lung and the heart and the brain. And then, if, as if there wasn't you know, enough to worry about already, uh, there are individuals making, you know, outside of you know, organized pharmacies, synthetic fentanyl. And that is being put out on the streets as heroin. The only problem with that is it's many, many, many times more potent. And all throughout the eastern uh, part of the United States, there have been recent reports, and these have come in waves over the last 10 years where an area will be flooded with non-pharmaceutical fentanyl that comes in a powder form that looks like heroin, but when it's injected to even an experienced tolerant user, it's just way too high a dosage and an overdose can occur. So what are the key points here? If you just remember that morphine-like compound goes anywhere it wants to go in the brain, but the place we worry about most is that pleasure center because it can produce addiction and that breathing center and level of alertness center. They occur naturally in plants and in our brains, so they're meant to be there, but they're not meant to be misused or used in high dosages and the intent is certainly not to progress into addiction. And the increase in the deaths we've seen is both due to 
the increased use of prescription medications in the United States as well as the expansion of heroin use and the interplay between those two, that crossover between expensive pills. I've had patients myself who were spending four to six hundred dollars a month, you know, a good car payment, uh, on pills purchased from the internet, which is still possible to do that. Uh, and it gets really scary when somebody's using 30 or 40 pills a day. Uh, so they'll often cross over to heroin because it's cheaper and it will prevent withdrawal to some degree from developing.